Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Stephanie Costello. I'm the Director of Programming for Expo Chicago, as well as the Editor-in-Chief of The Scene, Chicago's International Journal of Contemporary and Modern Art. It is our pleasure to welcome you today to Dialogues, presented in partnership with the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Dialogues is a year-round series of panels, symposia, and provocative artistic discourse featuring leading artists and curators on the current issues that engage them. Today we are thrilled to be presenting the In Situ panel entitled Chronopolitics, sharing the same name of the program curated by the amazingly talented Flora Listeria. We are so thrilled to have been working with her this year on the program. She will be speaking with three artists featured, including LeVar Monroe, represented by Jenkins Johnson Gallery, Dan Peterman, represented by Rona Hoffman Gallery, and Bethany Collins, represented by Patron. Please join me in extending a very warm welcome to our panelists. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Florence Zoya, the director of Institute this year. Um, thank you so much, all of you, for being here. Hello again. <laughs> um, we're going to start, um, I'm going to start by introducing Lava Manro, who is sitting um, closer to me. Lava um, was born in 1994. I think it's important to give some uh, biographical uh, elements uh, in the Bahamas, in Nassau. And he currently lives between Washington, D.C. and Nassau, in the Bahamas. Um, we're going to start with um, a very simple discussion about the general uh, practice of each of these amazing artists who are in participating in the Institute. Uh, this year, there are um, nine other artists participating uh, who couldn't be here today, but are with us in sports, obviously. Um, uh, Bethany Collins, next to Lava, was born in 1980. 1984, and lives here in Chicago. Um, but um, then uh, Dan Peterman, who is also uh, from Chicago, but born in Minneapolis in 1960. Uh, each of these artists um, agreed to discuss um, their practice generally. We have a PowerPoint, which is going to allow us to go more in depth into their art. And um, we will have then more uh, precise question about the work that they are showing as part of an uh, institute, and then we will obviously open the discussion to all of you. Lava, maybe we can start. I will just give you the possibility to start. Maybe the the PowerPoint first, and then yeah. This is the work which is currently shown, which you probably also already. So we're going to get back to this later, and then. We will start with uh, this amazing piece, and I'll let you. Okay. So recently I've been collaborating with my father, and the collaboration has been happening with him not only do, doing so. Um, and that in the initial interest came about after doing some research on something called a monomyth, which is um, which is the hero's journey, also known as the hero's journey. Um, there was a specific point within the monomyth that spoke about the father and the son competing for the love of, of the mother. And my dad and I had, had um, proposed to do a project where we collaborated to metaphorically connect with my deceased mother. The intention was also for him to better understand my practice while I understood his, his profession, which was power sailing, using parachutes, um, so far so on. Um, my father died before we could have um, accomplished that, that thing, um, that, 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 um, the collaboration. And since then, I've been doing these um, both homages, but also taking on this collaborative role with my deceased father. How my father collaborates is each of these parachutes he owns. And, and within the parachutes they were used, first of all. Um, and a lot of them are stitched and, and, um, and the, the ropes, actually there, there's no parachute on this, but the ropes are, are also like tied, but also tied by him prior to his death. Um, 
and another form that the collaboration has taken is also these memorials. So the memorials being the work that we see here, but also um, they take the form of these horses that I construct using predominantly cardboard found within the specific place of the memorial. Um, with these um, particular works, it's very important that they are temporary, so they are only there for a certain amount of time, and they are usually destroyed afterwards. Um, and metaphorically, I do that obviously to speak about the impermanence of life, um, the impermanence of our lives, um, but also using the, the horse as a metaphor for, for life, for death, for triumph, etc. So in a nutshell, that's the work um, I'm currently exploring at the moment. Bethany. <clears throat> Bethany Collins. Do you want me to talk about this first since it's here? No, I don't. <laughs> Stop with the yeah. southern. Yes. So, uh, my work in general concerns ideas of race, identity, history, and language. Language is the material of the work in every body of work I've done since grad school. It is the, the subject and the material out of which the work comes. But I've also found it's a kind of prism through which I can interrogate other ideas. I look at archives of language, and dictionaries, encyclopedias, etc., that it reveals something um, or allows me to dissect, in a way, these other concerns uh, when it comes to race and identity and American history. So. Um, this series actually started when I moved to New York. So I'm originally from Montgomery, Alabama, and the South is very much at the heart of my practice. It, when I go home, it, uh, it reminds me why I'm working, but I've never called myself Southern. It's a particular term that to me images a different body than my own. To say Southern is to image a white male body, and my body does not fit within that realm easily at all. Um, and so when I moved to New York, there was a, a show up at the Studio Museum created by Thomas Lacks about uh, you know, southernness and what does it mean to make work that embodies these ideas of the South and what does it mean to be a southern artist. And it was a beautiful show. But people were coming through uh, that show and then up to my studio, and I started to get this question over and over again, oh, how does it feel to be a southern artist living in New York? What, is that, what does that feel like? And it was said with a particular tone that I did not know how to respond to, but also because I had never thought of myself within that terminology. So I found this Southern Review Journal. It's been published since the 1930s, uh, with a brief break from World War II. Um, it's a very prestigious journal. Uh, and so I decided to rip apart this very prestigious journal. Uh, and the rule for the series is that for every issue within the Southern Review, I'm filling in the body of the page's text. So titles are untouched, uh, authors are untouched, page numbers, headers, all of those other kind of page layout uh, things very specific to the journal are untouched by my hand. The only thing that I am manipulating in a way is filling in with a super rich, soft charcoal the body, that heft of the text on the page. And that then was my response to how I image the southern body and how I might reimagine that southern body to make myself fit within it or to expand what it is. By the time these pieces are finished, my fingerprints are all over the surface. It's a very velvety charcoal. I'm also choosing certain pages, and so there's an editing of the narrative of what it means to be southern as well. So for this series, I'm, I'm working through the 80s, it's the decade of my birth, and then it will just have to be finished. This is a very special work within that series, though, because in 1985, they had an editor change at the Southern Review. And so the editor's note at the beginning was something, it was a little bit more elegant way of saying, oops, we haven't had a lot of black authors before now. Here they all are, one time, done, right? It's like the corrected addition to the archive. And so there was a lot of language by authors that I admire that did not feel like it necessitated my hand. And so a system is always important to me in my, in my work, in every series, and this is the one time that I uh, broke the system. And I don't know if it'll happen again, and I don't know what it means, but it just exists. Maybe that's enough. Uh, and so 
this is another series that's ongoing within my practice. It's a series of contronyms. So contronyms are words that em, uh, embody their own contradiction. There's 80 of these in the English language. They exist in other languages, but I don't, I'm monolingual, and so it would be difficult for me to find the poetry uh, working alone. So right now I'm focused on these 80. My favorite contronym to date is quiddity. Quiddity is the essence of something and a trifling nothing. So it's everything and it's nothing at the same time. That feels, when I stumbled upon these contronyms in general, but also that specific quiddity, feels like a way that we could be talking about race. It is everything and it is nothing simultaneously. And maybe 10 other things, right? It's not just solely about that one topic simultaneously. Um, so this piece, yeah, so for the contronyms then, I'm printing them on this uh, Somerset Radiant White Paper or American Masters Bright White Paper, pulling them from these Webster's New World Dictionary. It's like the, the colonial is embedded in the material, in the language itself. And then I use my spit and erase everything except those opposing definitions. So what has to remain and abide one another is the, what's in opposition. And what falls beneath from my spit erasure I save, and that becomes the same thing, I think. The essence of the thing is still there. This is still bound from 1968. It, it's the erasure of bound, and yet calling it the same thing means that the form has shifted, and yet something remains embedded in the language. So we will get back to the works, and then I will just let Dan speak now. Thank you. Is this? Yeah, sorry. Um, coming from Chicago and being here for a long time, I have kind of a selection process of you know, what, to, what to talk about. Um, some of you may know that I've been very involved in something called the Experimental <coughs> Station and a kind of alternative practice, social practice side on the mm -hmm. south side of Chicago, which has always been a kind of tandem uh, site and way of working and thinking for me as an artist. I'm not talking about that today, um, but it's, um, it's something that's relevant to how I think and it relates to a kind of interest in art and ecology that moves into urban space and flow of materials through urban space and uh, as well as um, recycling systems, loops of materials and materials as they're transformed through industry, through interventions at, at, by um, me as, acting as an artist, uh, as well as just other, um, other things that happen as materials move through, through waste systems or um, consumer networks. Um, this is a piece called Running Table that <coughs> relates to the Love Podium, which is the piece here in, in situ. It's made out of a material for, that was first produced in the 80s, uh, recycled plastic. Um, really, plastics were not recycled prior to, to the 1980s. They were basically a disposable material that moved into the landfill. And um, I was quite interested in, in the nature of a material that was coming out of the waste stream and being introduced to the world as a kind of new material, but a material that didn't really need to be here other than it was a way of diverting a stream of waste. So I've always been a kind of critic of plastics even though I've done things that are kind of like design interventions that often seem to celebrate the material. I know there's a little bit of a double edge in, in my work. These were basically pieces that I was thinking about this heavy massive recycled plastic material as a kind of container. And the sculpture making was a kind of strategy of containing this material that really wasn't resolved, like why it was in the world, how we were using it, how we were thinking about recycled plastics, for example, as part of a larger network of um, petroleum-derived materials that we, of course, have an extremely problematic relationship with in, in ecological terms. So running table was a kind of endless um, a structure Modularity is something I've been interested in because it's like sculptures that can grow, that can accommodate more material, that become simultaneously a kind of storage strategy, uh, a point of continued consumption, and a point with a kind of another level of utility um, within it. And they sit in public kind of waiting 
as, as they're used in some way, they're, they're this kind of um, receptacle. Um, actually, can, can you hand the clicker? If I can do it, or either way. It might be easier, because I've got a few more images, but I don't want to don't, don't take too long. This is the same material um, in a less controlled um, manner of production, where plastics were quite randomly pushed through an extrusion process. The color is completely arbitrary, colors of the consumer world. And maybe you've related a little, little bit to what Bethany was talking about, you know, creating a sort of archive and thinking about, you know, language and the language through materials. This is like a post-consumer color database, right? Every little bit of plastic is a different color as it's pushed through this process. Um, this is uh, summer. This, the floor that's used by Summer Dance, which, which is a public music program here in Chicago. Whoops. Sorry, I went to a couple of my head. But again, it's putting this material that you know is kind of camouflaged as a, as a you know as a dance floor, but it's still this kind of modular container of material that is in this in between sort of. Status or a, you know a kind of ambiguous place in, in the world as a, as a leftover um, as a material that's kind of struggling for um, meaning and, and appropriate use and appropriate uh, ways of, of like being in the world. Um, just quickly, um, I was involved in the last documenta, which uh, I, most of you know took place between Athens and Castle. For me, the opportunity to work in those two cities opened up um, the, the, a possibility of looking at recycling networks, looking at materials, kind of uh, freshly tracking some of, some of the, the way materials were moving that, um, that I, I was familiar with, but in, in this new setting. And I ended up um, working with iron, specifically in Germany, in Kassel, and um, copper in Athens. And the project was called the Indian Project. So it was kind of slipping behind the world of products into the level of um, kind of pre-commodity form. Again, modular and kind of endless in scale, somewhat in relation to what I was just describing with the, with the recycled plastics. But the ingots also become a kind of currency of, of the material that's feeding into industry. But you know, we're all familiar with gold bars and gold bullion and speculation of, of uh, material. Um, so it was a project that kind of moved between these material networks and as well as the histories of where these materials were coming from. Obviously, the history of iron in the you know, 20th century Germany, the, the buildup of, of industry, of the war machine, of, you know, iron is, is very much uh, central to uh, an economy with, you know, massive consequences to, to, um, to how we live now. Um, copper, this, this is uh, the storage yard of the company that I worked with and used the ingots in, in uh, showing them. And uh, so in Castle, the ingots were presented in multiple sites from a retail space, this used to be a wedding dress shop, to the first the first shot with the wag the, the white bags and the iron ingots was um, a former post office building that was used in in this year's uh, documenta and then it also was presented in a few places that were not really labeled and not identified this for example was the cart that kind of moved in between a few different sites depositing ingots um, there was a site next to the railroad tracks. There was a place in a garden behind a tree, behind one of the venues. And so it, it was kind of like these ingots were leaking out of the exhibition space and out of the specific uh, sculptural installations and became this material kind of in the background that you could see out of the corner of your eye, either you know, casually moving by or in a kind of unexpected encounter. So a little bit like the, the plastics, it, you know, it's thinking about these materials in their systems in the world and still as sculptural propositions. I don't want to just transform them into fixed sculptures, but to allow them to resonate 
you know, with the kind of systems and economies that, that these, these materials are really moving through the world in. Um, this is a, just a glimpse into the process in, in uh, Athens where I worked with um, salvaged copper and produced ingots locally. So um, using a circular ingot casting table that I found in a scrap yard, we um, recast copper ingots that were a reference to the copper ingots you could see in the archaeology museum going back to copper shipping in the, uh, in the Mediterranean back at like 1200. So here, here are the ingots being popped out. So we had this kind of artisanal level of scavenging ingot production in Athens and the industrial iron ingots in, in uh, Paso. Um, and then just the last project here, um, going back to plastics, this is something that I'm working with in collaboration with a, a physics professor at the University of Chicago who studies material um, behavior and particles and specifically is interested in the idea of jamming and jamming particles. And so in his laboratory they became quite interested in the way Z forms, Z shapes, in uh, accumulated quantities act and interlock and become a solid but a kind of fragile solid. And when they begin to break down they let go and they act like liquid. And so it became a kind of exploration of this idea of slipping and jamming that for me was very interesting to, you know, put back in the context of recycled plastics and thinking about these petroleum molecules as they slip and jam through consumer networks and, you know, the, the, the way that we use and abuse uh, 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 petroleum resources in general. So the project became, you know, about slipping, slipping and jamming. Here, for example, with, with no kind of binding agent are the Z-forms you know, f forming this arch, and so it's an interesting thing that's kind of coming out of out of their laboratory, but can now exist in the in the world in in this other way. So it's a kind of fluid approach to sculpture. Again, you know, a non-fixed, non-permanent form. They basically get broken down and ha are hauled around in potato sacks, and then uh, and then installed. So anyway, stop there. Thank you very much. So we can already understand that. Uh, even though Dan, Bethany, and, and Lava develop very, very different, very personal works, they share um, strong common grounds. We talked a lot about recycling, recycling cardboard, recycling books, ink, and so on, um, written material, recycling plastic, or um, other uh, materials. Uh, there is a very common um, political ground in their work as well, the connection with the social realm, um, political concerns, and we're going to talk about this, I imagine, with Lava, and the way you um, recycle found cardboard in your majestuous, um, monumental sculpture. The, the, the confrontation between the two is quite fascinating, uh, really, uh, your desire to build um, fantastically uh, grand sculptures with found material, savage material. Uh, maybe we can start again with the, the PowerPoint and talk more about this, uh, this installation that you created for Institute, because the, this is important to say that the installation was produced really in this context. Um, you mentioned that it's the fourth um, part of a, of a series of work. Maybe you can tell us a bit more about the way you proceeded. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I think a good point you kind of um, pointed to that I didn't get to speak about was the notion of cardboard. Um, and for me, I see cardboard in like multiple ways. I mean, first it's free, <laughs> which is always, always a good thing. Um, but I think about it um, societally. So in society, people of of high means, they receive these things in cardboard. Um, but after they excrete the product from the cardboard, the cardboard is then threw back into, into the world. And the people who who tend to, to, to grasp to, to this material are people of lesser means. So many homeless people use it for beds. Um, they use it sometimes for plates to eat out of, to make toys. So, so I enter most of the sculptural works with that notion, knowing that 
this was the role, this was once the role, this is the current role, and now we're going to redo, um, we, we're going to try to recontextualize what, what this thing should be. Um, and in that sense, I'm also thinking about the notion of trickery. So the idea of artists as trickster. Um, and it's important for me because it definitely points to, um, to alchemy, like, like what, in, in what ways can we make this disposable thing that people are walking by and pretty much ignoring a valuable commodity. So yeah, so basically entering it in, in that sense and then to speak about it on, in a larger sense, um, the cardboard and the sculptural things become very specific very quickly. Um, they take the form of things, obviously, recognizable things. In this sense, we have a figure who is either ascending or descending, but surrounded by dogs. I think dogs are, uh, dogs are another very important element of, not only now, but historically. Um, you think about dogs being used to hunt slaves. To, to hunt black and brown bodies. I, I think that that's a, that was the initial entry point into, into the use of the dogs. But also thinking metaphorically, I mean, the dogs as a metaphor for the current style of society today, worldwide. I think about those type of things. And then I also think um, about disease. I mean, again, it's a memorial, it's a collaboration. But at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's celebrating the life of my father. Um, in the most simplest sense for me. Um, and in his sense, he died from cancer, so the dogs become these, these attack me mechanisms attacking our body. So yeah, so most of my work, they, they, they hit multiple, multiple, I guess, points within, within a, a critical space. Um, and I think that's the strength of, of, of most of it. So, yeah. Can you maybe, you mentioned that it's a posthumous collaboration but still the work is ongoing. Can you maybe explain a little more about this collaboration? Yeah, so I mean, so initially it was supposed to be an actual <laughs> collaboration. Um, he was busy, I was busy traveling, doing my thing, and we just never got a chance to do it. Um, but the, his, his, his role is, I mean, so, so the role that these parachutes are playing is what he, sh he was going to do anyway. You know, so it was, it kind of, the idea kind of happened, um, so I obviously lived in the U.S. for a while, but every time I, go, I would go home to the Bahamas for a break, I would go to his house and the back of our, we had like a pretty, well, a pretty big backyard, but the backyard would be draped with these parachutes. So these parachutes, so what he was doing was every day after work, he would bring the parachute that he would use on the water and drape it across the backyard to spray it, to, to clean it, pretty much. And time after time, I just would go home and I just would be so fascinated with the color, but also with the composition, like literally taking up the entire yard. Um, and one day we had a discussion about it and I was like, Daddy, I think it would be a good idea if you and I can do a collaboration at the National Gallery of the Bahamas, which um, I, he, and he, the first thing he said was, I don't know nothing about art. And I was like, okay, we can do this together and I can show you. And through me showing you, I understand what you do and you understand what I do. So that was a deal. Um, and uh, I proposed it to the um, director of the gallery and she agreed. Um, but it just was keep on being put off. But I mean, long story short, um, his, 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 um, his contribution is the power shoots and, and specifically because the power shoots are used, they are stained with his, it's his soils from his, his body. They're also sewn, they're also braided. So all of these things is his work. Um, and yeah, I definitely think his, his role in this is, is, is greater than mine in many ways. And the initial, the, the initial, um, the conception of this work um, happened like months after he died. And I pretty much gave his, his portion of the collaboration full reign. So it, it was um, exhibited at the Savannah College of Art and Museum, I mean, Savannah College of Art and Design Museum. And what it was, was it was a power, I think I may have the slide, but it was a, just a power shoot draped from the roof going down, like a bulk-like thing. And my collaboration in that was to make an urn. Um, so my dad's request was to be 
cremated and have his, his ashes too overboard. Um, like Rennie or take my family, go and just let go of his ashes. Which I did, but I just let go half of the ashes. <laughs> so the other half I own. And that, do we have that at all? That, Go uh, one more. It, this, yeah. So this here in the vitrine is the urn that I made that houses ashes. So that was my collaboration. So the urn was my collaboration, but everything else in my mind was his work. Um, and one thing I remember prior to his death is the notion of trouble. He was always like, oh, I get out of this. I promise I won't miss any exhibition that you ever have again. So, um, so, so that was important for me to to, I mean, in the initial stages of this collaboration, to have him physically there. With his ashes being in this, it's, it's him physically there. Since then, um, I have not shown his ashes, or his urn, but, um, yeah, but this was the initial collaboration. Well, that's really interesting, is the, conf the, the confrontation between uh, elements which are extremely personal to elements which are absolutely collectively sh shared. I mean, Obviously, I'm working, but um, that that um, also confrontation between the, the grandness of the sculptures, the, the references to the historical um, sculptures as monuments, and uh, and this has very personal aspect. It's something we find as well in your work, but so maybe we can just go on. I know we're running out of time. That was the sketch that Lava sent us uh, when we were working on in situ. So that you have the behind the scene a bit. A bit. But um, Bethany, uh, Bethany's uh, work is shown here as well. So here we are with the Birmingham News from 1963. So this year, so 1963, the Birmingham News editorial board made a very conscious decision not to publish any civil rights stories that were happening locally. Whereas all the other, most of the other national papers had the um, iconic imagery now of the fire hoses, the water hoses, the, the police dogs, it's that kind of imagery. Front page, above the fold, multiple images. Birmingham News, where these um, uh, uh, civil rights protests and demonstrations and arrests were happening down the block from the newspaper, instead chose to focus on their front page, a story about Sophia Loren being sick in bed. Their reporter went to the zoo and had a really big snake, and that was quite a big story for a couple of days. Um, and so the work then, you can see in detail, uh, is this blind embossing of those cover pages. So I went down to the Birmingham Library and looked through their, their microfiche, their archives, found these pages in which something particularly violent occurred and was not reported on um, in the local paper, uh, relayed out that imagery rematched all those old 1960s fonts, because they were all a little bit wonky, um, and then engraved plates with those cover pages and soaked some paper and ran that through the press. And that became the first of the series for this Birmingham News. The blind embossing is a part of my practice, I think, now, and important to this particular work, because there's a way in which you are printing nothing, right? and a way in which the story, which is at the heart of what was happening in this moment is not present. Um, but for this series, um, or the work that's here in situ, everything happens twice. So the soaking of the paper happens twice, the pressing of the paper happens twice, the lifting of it and laying it back down, everything is recycled and repeated. I was reading, this was post-election, I was reading uh, Isabel Wilkerson's essay in The Fire This Time. And she talked about it's a beautiful way to describe this post-election moment, where it felt like the 60s were our ground, and the belief in the 60s that we could not fall beneath that moment, right? That we just had to build on top of that, and we would be okay. And that this then moment feels like that ground is shakier than any of us expected. This work then, for me, I don't know, it captured that feeling of you know going back to the 60s, feeling like we are recycling that moment, and also that the institutions that I thought were more hardy uh, are more fragile than I expected. And so the paper starts to fall apart in response to that fragility. And I tend to let the paper fall apart as it will. However it wants to go, it goes. And so sometimes they hang on by a, by a single thread on the edge of the paper. Um, 
and they exist as they are. I like to show them um, unframed as part of that blind embossing. I want you to want to touch it. I want you to want to feel that text protruding from the surface and, and somehow make that text or language manifest in the body. Right? Something about that was quite important in that work. We have that, a few minutes, but maybe could you please speak about the, uh, the, book. the yeah. book? So the book is new. It's Thank called you. America Hymnal. Super new for me. Um, so from eight, the 18th century to the 20th century, my country, Tizabi, the lyrics for it, were rewritten at least a hundred times. Right? So it's this very patriotic song that most of us, 80s, babies at least learned in school. You sang it quite often in school, collectively. And yet from those 18th to 20th centuries, the song was rewritten by suffragists, by the temperance movement, by abolitionists, by the Confederacy. Everybody took the song and made it to their own ends. And so I remade, or kind of made a hymnal of all these different versions of this one patriotic, semi-official anthem, national anthem. Um, the text then is legible. Those 100 versions are still present. The differences are legible. What's unifying in the text, the music, which is the same tune, no matter which version, uh, lyrical version you're singing, that has been burned away throughout the entire text. So again, this feels like a response to now. Right? Feels like what we agreed upon, the music is gone, and all the differences remain. And I think what will come next, I'm hoping, is a singing of all these versions. It feels important. And a new step within my practice to sort of re-vocalize or verbalize the language I'd already been using. Mm -hmm. Totally. Mm -hmm. That's amazing because obviously the connection with Dan, Dan's work in institute. Uh, um, we don't have a picture here, but... <coughs> no, no, I, we I, don't. I don't. Yeah, so... But the podium, I mean, the, the, the running table. This question in public space. Yeah. Um, <laughs> should I talk about it? Just yes, a, a can few you minutes? let yeah. us know in which context? Because the piece was made in 2006, and like uh, the works we just spoke about with Laval and, and Bethany. So can you please maybe explain yeah. in which context this work was specifically Yeah, the, the, the love podium is um, based on the geometry of a love seat where you sit in opposition somebody, you know, 180 degree uh, shift, but it's two speaking platforms, so it's proposing simultaneous language, like standing shoulder to shoulder, somebody addressing your audience, but the language, you know, simultaneously mixing. And it was something that I was, um, you know, it, it was a kind of expansion of the idea that this public motion of materials and that, that kind of material thinking and putting it back in public and how it could function. So as a speaking platform, um, I was very aware at the time of uh, following the, the um, Bush-Clinton uh, um, uh, campaigns. And you know, it's something that we, that we all recognize in a two-party system. There's always this kind of opposition of every idea that's, that's presented. There's this request for the counterpoint. And there's this canceling out that happens, where everything has kind of an equal counterpart, gets equal time, equal exposure, and you know, this flattening out of language. So I was very aware of building this dual podium as a kind of response to the canceling of language. And it was a kind of playful thing that now has, um, at times, well, I've had the invitations, depending on where it's installed, for people to propose texts that can be read simultaneous, you know, looking for kind of oppositional text that can be read um, simultaneously as a kind of performative thing. And so, um, you know, there have been some fluxus events using it as a kind of stage, you know, reading some of these texts, but also that there are scores, for example, from, um, you know, fluxus events that use the, the platform. So, you know, this kind of playful um, sense of being in public and how language operates in public, but how so often um, you know, real meaning or real dialogue or real communication is, is lost somehow in the formal structure of, of the political system or, of, you know, the means of, 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 of expression. So. so we can maybe open up to questions if there's 
anyone who would like to ask uh, Lava or Bethany or Dan a question about the works? Yes, please. I've got a question for Bethany uh, because uh, now I don't have to shout. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is about the, the form of your erasure because uh, there's many ways to strip away language from a page, but yours is uh, uh, provocatively corporeal. It's a, a spit moistened finger that becomes the instrument. So the thing that falls away from the page uh, carries your DNA with it. And uh, maybe you could elaborate on the meaning of that. I think the language I know that the language that I choose feels as if it does not include, has not considered my body in the world. Uh, there are always problem texts, or there's some problem within the text. And so placing my body in the language and then erasing until my mouth is dry or my hand is too cramped to continue writing until there's some sort of painful moment in my body makes it feel as though the language now comes backwards. And so I am in it, and it is in me. And for me, it's a kind of, it's, it is a, a control move. It is about a mastery over the text that did not, uh, did not concern me to begin with. And that's mine. And if it lives in your home, then now you have to live with it too, right? There's something about that being, being everywhere. Another question? Maybe? Ah. <laughs> the stage is yours. Thank you. One of the things that uh, I've long enjoyed about uh, your work, Dan, is uh, uh, the, the duplicitous nature of um, the simple forms you work with. Uh, I wished to uh, check out a book or two from One Tongue Library when I saw it at uh, Mass Mocha. And uh, I, I think there's something profound in work whose casual arrangement suggests a kind of reading as opposed to the utilitarian function of dance work. Maybe you could talk a little bit about, about how the grain of reading is present in the work. So, so this is one ton archive, and you can see the, the material is recycled plastic, you know, all this data basically in material form from, from containers, the color. Um, in terms of reading, this, this is actually a project I did long after, you know, starting to think about this, this material. But it was looking at it more as a kind of database and recognizing that the color, the coloration, this, this that all of it was basically pushed through a kind of extruder that was a kind of infinite machine painter's palette, right? Where color was continually mixing. Um, but that that was a, a, a kind of data. So making these kind of surrogate books, creating archives, but archives that could also be measured by weight and volume. They fill space in, in this way that is a little bit of a, like a, div a diverted waste process or a storage process, but it is, it is a kind of reading. I mean, it's part of you know taking what we know and how we process information and recognizing that, that that can move you know through materials and through our awareness of how things are made and how we can project back into it to you know a kind of endless world of, of items and things, you know, consumer products, you know, in, in the world of plastics, like it's such a a rich set of associations to, to really read back into. So, uh, yeah, when I when I became aware of this, you know, what this meant as a kind of surrogate book and archive, and especially when you cut this material open, and you know, like in in geological materials, marbles, and you know, every time you make a cut, there, there's a new revelation, you know, of of the order of things that was deposited by geological time, or just in this case. The, the moment when it's kind of pushed through a machine and these molecules are kind of put, put in this form. So, yeah, I think, I think the act of reading is something that as I slowed down as an art maker, just over time, I mean, I often kind of never let go of, of, of things. And um, so re reading this kind of opened up other 
other you know, sculptural strategies. Yeah, the same with the Z forms and particles in, in a different way. I mean, it's not the book form, it's going back into the particles and having these different layers of, of particles being kind of jammed and thinking about how they move and how they connect and then how they also disperse and how they continue to kind of flow in a you know somewhat um, chaotic manner. I mean, again, kind of the nature of plastics that, it, you know, in a lot of ways I'm not that far from things that Roland Barthes wrote about in the late 50s. I mean, he set a lot of ideas in motion around plastic as a kind of suspicious ma material. Um, and so some of that is still, I think, in, in what I do, even though I have some very concrete connections to it, you know, through a kind of, you know, being a consumer and a kind of critique of consumer culture and then just as a sculptor, you know, material person, like being obsessed in how it carries information. There's another question over there. Yes, please. I was just wondering if, I was just wondering if you could use um, recycled plastic with the 3D printer and if you've done any experimenting with the 3D printer. And is there a way to use recycled plastic rather than generating new plastic, which we know we don't really want more? Yeah. You know, it's not really my expertise like that. The, the, the technology, I think you, you can. Because I think that would I mean, be kind of cool. To yeah, yeah, I think you can, and, and printers, I think, are incorporating more and more materials, including, you know, a, a lot of research on synthetic, not just biodegradable, but, mm -hmm. but, you know, really different sources of getting to polymer chains that can, you know, create plastics. And mm -hmm. I think 3D printing is, it's no doubt, I mean, it's, it's on the very near horizon you know, mm -hmm. increased use of that. You know, whether it's something that feeds into my thinking as, as an artist that, you know, I'm, I'm not quite sure. I mean, I haven't really worked with 3, 3D printers. Then another quick question. Was, um, whose idea was it for the Dance Chicago? Because I have to say that's like my favorite thing to do in Chicago in the summer. So I, uh, many years of you know, Chicago dance, summer dance. So I was just wondering that the city came up with the idea and approached you for the floor? Or no, might yeah, that have the, been the your floor idea? existed as a kind of Carl Andre, you know, ah, revisiting okay. like minimal strategies, using the horizontal plane, using the modularity, using the idea of, you know, a, a piece that could again, absorb endless volume. It was a piece, you know, called ground cover. That's still what it's called. It's known more as the summer dance dance floor now, but it's a, it's a sculpture called uh, ground cover, and I had installed it um, in what is now Millennium Park. It was, you know, a much, much more modest park before that was built, so it's, it's been in operation, I don't know, what, 15 or 16 years. So it was installed, and um, really coincidentally, the Department of Cultural Affairs started the summer dance program, and somebody asked me, like, would it, would, you know, you'd be willing if we had this band set up, do you think people could dance on the, on, on your piece? Like, would that be okay with you? And so, you know, I, I said yes. And, but then, but then the floor came back, driven by the, the, the dance event, which, which is interesting. And it's grown, it's expanded, it was reinstalled, it was moved, it was reinstalled. And I'll, you know, have kind of a maintenance contract for the dance floor, but it's still the sculpture. And, and you know, my agenda operates beneath the surface of, you know, most people's awareness of it is, as you said, as a, as a dance floor. And, you know, I'm really interested in, I mean, it's a kind of drift of, of identity and awareness but it still kind of fully aligns with like that I wanted to put it in a public space and that it's passing time and it's waiting and it has this utility, but the utility is a, you know, it's kind of a means to another end. So it's been really interesting to see, you know, how, how that how that work has worked. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. We have time for one more question, maybe? Please. I, I feel so <laughs> That's a very good sign, thank you. But uh, in fact, I, I have a long-term relationship with Lavar, so 
a former teacher of his. And so uh, I, I'd love it if you could say uh, a couple of words about enchantment. Because uh, uh, for all the ideological inscription of your work, fundamental to your practice is the making of an inert material into something that parallels a living vital force. I think this is intentionally to stun me. <laughs> Enchantment. I've never, no, I mean, it's, it's a beautiful thing to think about. I mean, I've never thought about the work in the sense of enchantment. Um, but I can, yeah, definitely point and relate to, to, to that notion. Um, again, alchemy becomes, you know, to, to transform this thing that's pretty much nothing into something that's big and grand and seeks attention and, and, and also has a, a monetary value. It once was pretty much nothing. I mean, people walk on it, people drive over it, and yeah, and to be able to, to, to build on, on on nothing and make something, I think, for me, is, is, is enchanting. Uh, and definitely points to enchantment. <laughs> Thanks. Well, thank you so much, um, Dan, Bethany, Lava, all of you, Stephanie. Um, I, um, I would recommend you, if you haven't seen the 12 projects of in-situ yet, which I doubt, obviously, but I will recommend you to take the program. There are little uh, uh, description of each work, and there is a map that accompanies this program. All the projects are announced by orange dots on the map, so they are easy to find inside the fair. They're all inside uh, the art fair. Thank you so much. Um, have a great day. Thank you.